Hello and welcome to another very entertaining video. Today I'd just like to introduce the concept of hemostasis. And hemostasis simply is, of course, stasis is to stop and we're trying to stop blood. Um, this is all about blood clotting and the steps taken to get there. Now, I, I totally understand that, you know, the first response is going to be vascular spasm, smooth muscle contraction, that kind of stuff. We're not going to delve into that, but we're going to pick up the story with platelet plug and the official blood clot associated with fibrin crosslinks. Not going to go into detail, but just to introduce how these steps work to control the formation of a blood clot. And also to talk just a little bit about how to prevent spontaneous clots from forming. All right, we've kind of got a sagittal section of a blood vessel here, uh, a vein that we want to take a look at and see if we can't identify some of the key parts that are going to be important for our story. Of course, we see healthy intact endothelial cells, shown here in yellow. As they're endothelial cells, they need a basement membrane to sit on. So we see the connective tissue basement membrane here, and it's going to be relevant because connective tissue has a lot of collagen. Of course, being transported, we have red blood cells. We also have thrombocytes or platelets. Remember, these are cell fragments, essentially a large megakaryocyte hanging out in the red bone marrow continues to shed, to pinch off bits and pieces of itself. So they have organelles, they don't have a nucleus, but in many ways they're kind of small, tiny cells. The other player that I want to mention here really quick is this little green dot, VWF, stands for von Willebrand factor. Now under normal conditions, these things kind of all exist, but in an inactivated state. So I'm talking about the platelets, I'm talking about the VWF, Clotting is always kind of going on. I don't want my blood to get too thin, but if it gets too thick and I actually get real clots forming, then, then that could be problematic. Superficial thrombophobitis, um, or even worse, deep vein thrombosis. This could lead to pulmonary embolism, clots in the lung, and this, at the very least, is painful and could certainly be life-threatening. Key to the regulation of all of these pieces are healthy endothelial cells. And we've got another video that shows how these healthy endothelial cells contribute to the regulation or the prevention of spontaneous clot formation by inhibiting platelets. So we won't go into detail about those, but we do have, we can list them. We have coming from these endothelial cells, we've got nitric oxide, another signaling molecule called prostacyclin, and mounted on the surface of these cells, an ADPase, whose job it is to convert ADP into AMP. Those are the three primary mechanisms that the endothelial cells use to block platelet formation. If you want details on how those work, please uh, watch the other video. Of course, our story here is to understand what happens to activate the system when things go wrong. So let's take a look at how damage to the system can initiate a chain of events leading to clot formation and hemostasis. One of the key initiators following damage is simply exposed collagen. As we can see now down here on the bottom, if the endothelial cell layer is disrupted, collagen is exposed to these players that would never otherwise see it. They're just used to seeing these endothelial cells. But once the endothelial cell layer is compromised, collagen becomes exposed. And collagen is the target of von Willebrand factor, VWF. Now VWF, like we said previously, it is hanging out in the blood, and so these VWF molecules circulating in the blood are going to come down, and they're going to bind to exposed collagen. We also have a lot of VWF in healthy endothelial cells. And once, once these endothelial cells are ruptured, we have an increased amount of VWF coming from those cells, also binding to exposed collagen. This is really the first step toward platelet activation, and that's what we need to do. We need to first build a platelet, and then we'll be bring in fibrin to super glue it all together. So now we've got VWF down. VWF is the target for platelets. In other words, platelets have receptors that recognize VWF on them. This leads to a recruitment of platelets binding to the VWF. Now platelets, you can really think of platelets as kind of your AAA roadside service, right? They're going to come help you fix a flat. They're going to do whatever they can to get you back on the road. And so when we think about platelet activation, we can think about the three steps of A, A, 
and A. This first step is adhesion. And what is it binding to? It's binding to VWF. And, of course, this is represented by step two shown above. This leads us to the next step, which is the second A of platelet activation, which is activation of the platelet itself. And I want you to understand that platelet activation is synonymous with exocytosis. Activation, this is exocytosis. These platelets carry granules, a couple of different kinds of granules, dense granules. We don't want to go into too much detail about what's in there. There's a lot of things in there. But as we think about this next step, shown here in three, this granule release has an important job in recruiting more platelets. So now we got more platelets coming down to join the party and also changing platelet behavior. Granules binding to platelets causes platelets to become sticky. Sticky to what? Well, sticky to one another. And so this leads to the next step, which is aggregation. And so as this process continues, these platelets stick to each other. They also change a little bit. They flatten out. They kind of squeeze together. They tighten up. So as more platelets come to bind, this is kind of the fourth step that we've talked about so far. And this leads to our complete platelet plug. This is enough to put a stopper in whatever damage there was, as long as it's small enough, that we can begin now to repair the damage. And with this, we've completed primary hemostasis, or platelet activation and the formation of the platelet plug. However, we're not done yet. There's a couple of problems with this. Number one, the platelet plug's not going to last for very long. Number two, it's kind of leaky. There's some things that we can do to really turn it into a solid blood clot. And that fifth step is when we superglue it all together with fibrin. We call this fibrin cross-linking. Whenever you hear the term cross-linking, just think, hmm, molecular superglue. And this fibrin comes in and superglues all this structure together. Now, hopefully you're asking at this point, well, where does the fibrin come from? Is it just hanging out in the blood or what? No, I don't want fibrin hanging out in the blood. Not like this. It's, it's too dangerous. And this is where secondary hemostasis comes into play. What I do have in the blood is a protein called fibrinogen. And fibrinogen, you kind of see that G-E-N, the gen on the end of it. This is a zymogen. And a zymogen is a fancy word. You might hear pre-pro protein as another form. These are proteins that are made, but they're specifically designed to be inactive. And there's lots of fibrinogen floating around in the blood, but it needs an activation signal in order to be turned into fibrin. In other words, what it needs is a big pair of scissors to take this fibrin and cut it, or to take this fibrinogen and cut it up and turn it into fibrin. And then that fibrin can be laid down as it binds to these platelets. Of course, that opens up another question. That pair of scissors right there, where did it come from? What is it? Well, the scissors themselves, this is a protein called thrombin. And it is at the core of the clotting cascade. We're not going to delve into the specifics of the clotting cascade, but we do have two different mechanisms. We have the intrinsic clotting cascade and the extrinsic. And both of these, once activated, focus their efforts on getting thrombin activated. Thrombin, then, as a pair of scissors, is able to cut up fibrinogen into fibrin, and fibrin can then cross-link the platelet plug completing the process of blood clot formation.